Welcome to another successful Encore Career Podcast being brought to you by Central Ohio Area Agency on Aging, Nationwide Insurance, Innosource, and our special episode sponsor, The Resume Coach. I'm Brett Johnson, longtime volunteer with Employment for Seniors, and with me is Executive Director Carol Ventresca. Hi, Carol. How are you doing, Brad? I'm doing great. Wonderful. We are in the middle of an incredible series of podcasts on creating resumes. And, um, you know, it's, it, we're sort of chuckling going, well, we should have probably done this first, but I think that this is a wonderful way for us to get information in, um, small pieces so that we can help our clients methodically work through creating their resume because it's so important, not just so that you can apply for a job, but that you're going to be a great job seeker and a great interviewee because you're going to have a good handle on all of your skills and accomplishments by the end of this. So our series of podcasts are including things like, you know, what's the basic information we include or not include on resumes, um, accomplishment statements and individual bits and pieces and all that they include um, to, that should be on your resume. So we've already gone through what's the purpose, um, resume formats, lengths, appearances, on the last podcast, we did um, a lot of detail on what's the contact information? What should you have on there? What are summary statements? Those are critical on a, on a resume and had a great conversation about that. So hopefully you've also heard that podcast and work experience. When do dates go in? How long and how far back are your work experiences? All of those are important pieces. So today we are going to conclude that area, that section on what to include in a resume. And that will, we'll talk today about volunteer experience and the value of volunteering on education and training. And the big issue is what not to include on a resume. So let me introduce our guest today. Sharon Hammersley is the principal coach of the resume coach where she helps job seekers conduct a 21st century job search. And Sharon is also a longtime supporter and volunteer for Employment for Seniors and the Career Transition Institute, as well as our facilitator for our career search workshops here at Employment for Seniors. So Sharon, welcome again to our podcast programs. Thank you, Carol. And, you know, we've had some really good conversations. So I'm looking forward to our conversation today, wrapping up what you should and should not include in your resume. Right. So we're going to get through this. And we want to make sure that everyone knows this is the third in this podcast series. So if um, you were referring back, just go back to those previous podcasts, catch up with us, and let's talk about all of the bits and pieces that are important in your resume. So one section that um, folks are sort of lost with a lot of times is um, that notion of, of volunteer experience. And I used to always tell my students, you can be a volunteer packing a box at a food pantry, or you can be a volunteer at that food pantry and coordinate other groups coming in to volunteer or donations or events. So whole different ball game in terms of the experiences that you're getting from that volunteer experience. So let's talk about that. So Sharon, um, one of the um, most important things at Employment for Seniors is our volunteer core. So we talk a lot about the, our volunteers and how uh, wonderful and very professional they are. And we actually did a podcast on volunteering. So refer back to that. But I think that um, individuals don't see the value or understand how valuable you can learn new skills and hone skills in a volunteer experience. So when do you differentiate that it's a volunteer experience or work experience? And how do you put those onto a resume? That's a great question. I tell people that the only difference between being a volunteer and an employee is the money going into the bank. Often, volunteer experiences are extremely valuable as part of your work history. If you think about it, um, perhaps at some point in your career, you've um, volunteered for a significant um, event or organization, and you're providing your services pro bono. For instance, um, I know of people, 
at Career Transition Institutes, they're financial people. They volunteer as treasurer. What could be more important than treasurer? Because those are the money folks. They tell you whether you have money in the bank. And really, when you do something pro bono, it's it's like um, MasterCard says, you know, um, everything else priceless. It is actually priceless, and volunteers are priceless. So if you are doing significant volunteer work pro bono in your field, that can actually go as a regular experience on your resume. In fact, right now, if you're between positions and you're looking for a position, but you're volunteering in an area where you have significant skills, I tell people just put that on your resume as a regular experience. That's what you're currently doing. And I think, Carol, you've recommended this for our employment for senior vol- seniors volunteers. Absolutely. Our employment for seniors volunteers, and I can't even tell you how many have come in, volunteered, done a fabulous job, but found a job. And we lose them. But that's okay. That's our business. That's what we're supposed to be doing. But our volunteer um, counselors are critical to not just the operations of the agency, but to each individual client who comes in to see us and get them on a job search on the right path, how much more valuable that can be. And they're using very high-level skills to do that. They can put that on a resume. We put it right up there at the top of experience as long as they designate in their title that they were a volunteer, there's nothing wrong with that, and an employer understands that. Yes, and many employers actually like to see this type of experience on a resume, whether it's featured under your experience section or as a separate section under volunteer experience, because most employers really are community-minded. They have their own initiatives. They see If they see that you're already involved in the community, they know that when they call on you as part of your employment, also to step out into the community and be a volunteer, that you're more than willing to do so. Right. So so I think that that's very important. And also, if you think about it for a minute, if you're currently looking for your next position, uh, an employer will often ask you, so what are you doing with your time while you're looking for a job? And looking for a job is a pretty much full-time job in and of itself. We all know that. But just to be able to say, um, I'm helping employment for seniors. I'm one of their volunteer counselors right now. And, you know, I've, over the past 10 weeks when I volunteered with them, I've actually interacted with 25 clients and helped them get started on their job search. And I think that makes a really good impression on an employer. You know, the other thing, too, from the standpoint of a mature job seeker, um, there are often times that you want to update some skills. And it's really hard to do uh, if you uh, if you don't know where to look. I mean, it, it, it's not that it's hard to update skills. That can be done. But if you don't know where to look, if you go into an agency and say, I need to update this skill, is there anything that you need to have done that matches I can be learning, I am willing to give you my time to learn, and you'll get this job, this task done. And so sometimes it's really the only way somebody can increase their skill level. So I think that that's a, um, it's, it's a great message to an employer that somebody is willing to go over and above to learn something new and to be better prepared to be a great job seeker. Yes, that's definitely a win-win both for the job seeker and for the next employer and for the agency right. that the job seeker is volunteering right. at. Absolutely. So, yeah. Well, next we want to look at the education and training section. And, and I think as a mature job candidate, you, you can attack that much differently than just give a young coming out of college having nothing to fill in that section they have a lot to play with here. Yes, you do. Um, you know, new college grads, um, they often list their degree, whether it's coming up or whether they just got it. They list that first, and that's perfectly appropriate for them. But as a mature job seeker, um, that information becomes less critical the further it is in the rearview mirror. So there are several ways that you can approach this. 
First of all, um, you definitely need to list all of your professional certifications. For instance, if you have an RN license, you need to list that it's current in the state of Ohio. And maybe you have an RN license, you maintain RN licenses in other states. Um, but you need to, you definitely need to list that license with the state of Ohio, the license number, and the date that it expires. If you are, for instance, a project manager and you have project manager certification, where did you get that from? You know, and how current is it? Some people, um, get a um, certification and then they let it lapse. Uh, financial planners, they have to have certain like Series 7, Series 61, I don't know what all the numbers are. And they do have to keep those current through continuing mm -hmm. education. So all of those are very, very critical. So, um, and then if you attended college or university, if you graduated, you list your highest degree first. But if that was, if you got that degree some time ago, you don't need to list a date. This is one place where dates are, are not required and actually should not be listed. So let's say that you graduated with a, with an MBA. So you just put, MBA, the Ohio State University. And if you had a concentration in finance or marketing or whatever it is, you can list that. But then there's a question that I often get too from people. Well, you know, um, I went to um, Ohio State for two and a half years, but I never completed my degree. So what should I do about that? And there are a couple of different strategies here, and there are some pros and cons about all of them. If you were um, attending college and you were studying towards a degree and it's in the area that you're now seeking employment in, and maybe you've actually been employed in that field, you just kind of got hired and you never got around to finishing your degree, um, you, you can still list that degree without any dates at, uh, at all. Say the Ohio State University coursework in finance, marketing, and business administration. And that's what you're working in now, so that that all works very well. Um, some employers may be a little hesitant about this. This is the con. They may say, well, okay, so why didn't you finish your degree? And then you need to have a really good answer for that. You know, Most of the time it's simply, well, you know, somebody thought that I was a really good hire and, you know, um, I would like to get back to my degree at some point, but right now, you know, I've got all the qualifications you need. So you do have to be a little bit careful about that. Um, and then finally, um, the whole thing about the high school or GED. Um, some job postings specifically mention high school or GED. In that case, you know, high school diploma, Lima High School, no date. Right. Yeah. Yes. So that that's what you need to to put in terms of your education and training. One thing too, if they've had college time, even if they haven't finished college, they don't have to put high school yeah. because the assumption is you can't go into college unless you have a high school degree or yes. a GED. Yeah. So you don't like like again take up space, take up that real estate yeah. if you don't have to. But I think that the overarching um, message in this section is not just that I've taken coursework and you're going to check and see with Ohio State or wherever I went to school that I actually got my degree. The message is that employers have jobs that need to be done. You need to show not only you can do the job day one, but that you have the capability of growing with that job, of learning more, of being willing to learn more, and having the capability of learning more. So this section is included not just that I went to school and finished in 1980, but that I have done other things. I've been a lifelong learner. I've taken up on opportunities to learn more and, and continue to do that. And that's important for me. Yes. Especially if you, if you seek certifications in various fields, right? Or if you take coursework, even like on Coursera, let's say that one of the qualifications for the job is advanced Excel use. And actually you haven't had much experience with that, but you've gone on Coursera and you can prove that you completed whatever 
requirements there were for that advanced Excel course that you took through Coursera. And if asked, you could actually show that interviewer charts and tables and um, other things that you've developed using the knowledge that you gained in Excel from that Coursera course. Exactly. And, and there are a lot of those kinds of bits and pieces of requirements in position descriptions that would be hard for somebody to get. And these are easy ways to show that you can do that job. And that you're willing to ta- do whatever it takes to learn something that maybe you don't quite fully know at this exactly. point. Exactly. Because your job is going to change. You could be ready to do that job on day one, but over the course of your work there, something's going to change and you're going to have to learn new things. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, um, uh, I have to say that there are a lot of our mature job seekers who do that, and a lot of them sort of give me the glassy-eyed look when I tell them they need to keep learning, but it, it's a really important thing. And I, I, I have the impression from talking to employers it's going to become even more important as time goes on. So even if you are working right now, listeners, don't make an assumption you're going to be in that job forever. Always assume that you need to continue learning. So good. Yes. And that's, you know, Sharon and I work together at Ohio State. So you could tell we're two academics sitting here. Now, we have gone through all of the bits and pieces of what has to be on a resume. There's a huge list of things that should not be on a resume or that are kind of up in the air. So give us some ideas. Okay. So one thing I sometimes see when I review resumes is people will include their hobbies. And I say, well, okay, why did you include your hobby? And they say something along the lines of, well, I thought it would make me a more well-rounded person and that the employer would like that. Now, maybe, maybe not. Okay. Um, if you're applying for a master gardener job, you better have a one acre garden. And that's not actually a hobby anymore. Right. Very but, much so. But, but other than that, really, uh, an employer could even see that as, you know, well, I wonder how much time they spend on this. And, you know, if, if their hobby is Game of Thrones, are they going to be playing it on the job? Oh, that's a true, true issue right <laughs> there. Yes. <laughs> That's so, not the message you want to send across. No. So, so where did that section, why did that section exist then? Why, why because traditionally it's always been there. Mm-hmm. Obviously we're talking about it, so it's it's been there for, who knows, 100 years. I'm wondering if it may have started where uh, gentlemen who were really good at golf wanted to work for people who were really good at golf. I mean, it, it could, could be, be as I, simple as that. You know, who knows? Because I see this being more emphasized the volunteer than yeah. the hobby. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and again, it, a real a, a resume is real estate. You yeah. use the space the best way you can, and hobbies are not going to get you the job unless there is a really true direct connection, and that doesn't happen too often. Yeah, that really does not happen that often. So then there are some other areas that get to be very tricky. Um, on a resume, you should not include any information to the extent you possibly can about being what's called in legalese a protected class. And that includes anything like um, racial, ethnic background, national origin, religion, sex, although we can sometimes determine that, especially age, if over 40, especially, uh, familiar status and, and any sort of physical or mental challenge or disability. Um, all of those things can, um, you may say, well, they're going to figure out my age probably, but you can, there are things that we discuss that you can do that. And they're probably going to figure out whether I'm male or female, maybe, but that, that shouldn't be the focus of it. Um, Now, some things get really tricky because you may be volunteering for a religious organization, a political organization, an advocacy organization. And that can get really tricky because, um, generally speaking, we try not to bring our politics to work and our religion to work unless it's a specifically, uh, 
unless the company or organization itself is specifically oriented in that direction. So what I recommend to people is if they, for instance, were the volunteer for a capital campaign for a new wing on their church, that they simply list that volunteer capital campaign um, for my church, um, manage a team of six volunteers, raise $750,000. Now, that's pretty impressive. And at the point at which you actually go into the interview, you're probably going to have a reference from one of the, some, somebody on the leadership in that organization, and that's great. So by then, it shouldn't be an issue. It's just a matter of finessing that initial step when you don't really – know who you're talking to next. So that can be quite a challenge. Sharon, I just thought of something that's sort of the flip side. Yeah. So if a candidate has worked for a political organization, political campaigns, state, local parties, whatever, yeah. and suddenly they don't want to do that anymore, yeah. then you're talking about, okay, well, you know, I was in this party and people who aren't in that party aren't going to hire me. So Again, maybe that functional resume may may come into play, which we talked about in the first podcast, so that the emphasis is on the accomplishments and your skills as opposed to where you worked. Yes, and that's a very good point. So that would be something to, again, think about. And for listeners, remember, functional resumes are not easy to do, and they have a place. So just work with somebody who's a, a really good resume coach um, or an agency like Employment for Seniors to work you through that process of developing a functional resume. That's a great suggestion. And then there's a question about um, any sort of disability. And and again, that's a tricky question. Um, you, if, the, if the disability does not affect your ability to do the job in any way, there's no reason to disclose. Now, sometimes, and I'll use myself as a personal example, I, I have a little bit of hearing loss, and it would be very challenging for me to conduct an interview with somebody if we were in a noisy room. So at the time of the interview uh, scheduling, what I would probably say to the person helping schedule the interview is, um, just so you know, I do best in interviews when I'm in a quiet setting. I don't even mention my hearing loss. I just say I do, I do best. So I'm hoping that maybe you can accommodate that. And that's all you really need to say. Right. This section, as all of the sections, truly are ways of showing an employer that you're the best candidate. So it's always done in the best light um, with the, the best information that you can give without being negative or pigeonholing yourself into any little cubby holes such as age or or gender. And it, it's it's you only give the information that you have to, and it's always done in a positive light. That's correct, yes. And I think that's the whole purpose. When you get down to what the resume is really all about, that's the whole purpose of a resume. You're always putting your best foot forward, and you're you're telling that potential employer why it is that they they really need to have you on their team. And I will make this point, too. If an employer, for any reason, um, seems to write you off because of anything on your resume, and whether it's age or um, anything else that you put on your resume, that may actually not be a good fit. So um, I I always say to people, well, if, if the employer wasn't real cool with the fact that you were maybe a little older than their average candidate. That says, that doesn't say anything about you. That says something about them. Absolutely. So you want to put your best foot forward and you want to really find that employer match, that employer that's right for you. And the resume is a critical piece of that. Wonderful. So if we wanted to summarize all the bits and pieces that go into a resume, from when we talked at the last podcast about contact information and experiences in the summary statement, um, the uh, volunteer experience, education, training, what would you say are the top like three or four tips that you want to give to our listeners? I would say the first tip 
and this is this is just this actually goes without saying is be truthful. Yes. Be positive, but be truthful. Um, there, there's a whole, probably millions of threads out there among recruiters on various blogs and, and web pages and things about what they discover about candidates that's not true. Right. And so you want to be truthful. But being truthful doesn't mean hiding your light under a bushel either. And actually, that's what's going to be our next podcast is talking about how not to hide your light under a bushel, how to discover and write and explain your accomplishments. So number one, be truthful. But number two, don't hide your light under a bushel. Um, be confident in what what you're saying and doing. And I think the fourth tip that I would really give is make sure that you, you know, that, that really you make a big effort to understand that employer's needs. Because if you understand that employer's needs and you are a good fit and you articulate that, that really will bump you up in terms of their willingness to want to talk to you and maybe even offer you the job. Those are great, great tips. I'm going to add one more, and that is don't be afraid to get help on your resume. Yes. Don't do a resume by yourself. You have to have other sets of eyes seeing it, not just for the typos and the grammatical errors, but just to make sure that you are getting all of this great information into your resume. Exactly. Wonderful. Sharon, thanks for joining us today. You're welcome. Glad to be here. Circle270media.com 